Hello, everybody, and welcome to the PC Gamer Show. My name is Tom Marks, Associate Editor here at PC Gamer. Uh, joining me this week is Mr. Wes Fenlon. Wes? Oh, I'm here. Yes, but, but I'm, we, not, I'm not the star this week. Though. No, we, we don't care about you, Wes. No, oh, no that's not Should true. I we just do. Leave? Yes, please leave. No, um, but we're also joined by a very special guest, Nathaniel Weiss, creator, uh, a current developer of Songbringer, joining us on the show today. How are you? I'm awesome. Well, glad to have you here, man. You're dressed like a wizard. We're, uh, I'm into it. It's great. Heck yeah, man. I'm feeling wizardly today. <laughs> is, this, is this every day for you? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it sucks, like, waking up because, like, I have to, like, fold the hat and get it, you know? Like, <laughs> things get really, really, you know, my, my lady doesn't like it so much. It must get you, like, in the mindset to work on your game. Oh, right? yeah. I sleep in the mindset. I wake in the mindset. I'm always in the mindset, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're going to have a, a look, a hands-on look later at uh, Songbringer, which, it, and correct me if I'm not doing justice here to it, but is essentially like a procedural Zelda 1, right? It's mm -hmm. like a Zelda 1 style game, but every time you play it, it's it's new. The dungeons are in new yeah, places, all that very stuff. Very good description. Cool. Yeah. I think I got that description from you, honestly. <laughs> yeah. So there yeah. we go. We'll be uh, taking questions about that, of course, from the chat and uh, and showing that off a little later in the show. Uh, but, of course, we're also going to be talking about uh, our, our regular topics. We're going to be looking at some latest news today. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about what we've been playing lately uh, and also just talking about, like, the Steam sale in general that's going on. That's kind of news, but uh, Steam sale's almost over, and we... Well, it's, it's got almost a week left. Right, right, but almost over in podcast land, is they could be listening to this and a day before. They could be listening to this 10 years from now. I suppose. I guess time is meaningless, and we're all gonna die, is is where we're going with why, this conversation. Why even buy games? I mean, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> what's, the, what's the point, really? But we had a, we had a couple uh, longtime listeners asking, saying that they missed our Steam sale recommendations from last Steam summer sale. Mm. Uh, so we want to bring that back a little bit while there's still a week left to grab games. Also, man, we got some subs coming in. So thank you very much to Pumpkin8119 for seven months and Varendeal for eight, who says, I want a hat like that. What's the 8119 for, Pumpkin? I want to know. Yeah, you got to let us know in the chat. Uh, but let's start off with some latest news. Let's start off with what's going on recently in PC gaming. Uh, the first thing I want to touch on is uh, a thing that we talked about last week, which is GTA modding. Um, it We touched on it pretty, pretty briefly last week, but there's been like a little bit of a development to, to catch people up who don't, might not know. Uh, last week or, or late the week before last? Right at the tail end of E3, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, it was right at the end of E3. Take Two issued a cease and desist takedown notice to uh, a mod called Open IV or Open Four. Whoa! Um, yeah, that was kind of out of the blue, and it's a mod that is like the crux of a ton of single player it's, mods. It's really a tool for for modding the game in general. So it wasn't just this one mod that like turned your character into a horse. It was the way that you could inject pretty much every other major GTA mod into the game. Yeah. So, pretty big deal. Yeah. Sounds like they're trying to kill all mods. Almost. That was that was what people took it as, for mm, sure. Yeah. The, the, the modding community was kind of like, this is GTA modding doomsday, yeah. right? Which is unexpected, because it's, you know, people have been modding Open 4, it's called Open 4 because of GTA 4. Like, mm. this has been a thing that people have been using for a long time. Wow. And the, the reason they, they did this um, was as a perhaps a bit of an overstep towards trying to fix some of the uh, like the hacking and cheating issues in GTA Online, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. a big part of the community was upset about as you, you know you would you would expect to be if you're really invested in GTA Online and there are people coming in and hacking and cheating and you know just ruining the game for you. Um, but not all the people who modded the game were, uh, were doing it to hack people in GTA Online. Some people just wanted their cars mm -hmm. to to fly or to mod Geralt into the game, which you can do, and just, you know, all <laughs> kinds of, like, there's so many crazy things you can do in GTA, right? Yeah. Uh, so that was uh, quite a kerfluffle last week. So the news since last week's show is that Rockstar at some point last week, not Take-Two, but Rockstar said, mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to find a way to allow single player mods to still be made um, is essentially what the point was. They were like, we don't, they, they basically were like, 
we don't condone any cheating in online, like Wes said, but we don't want to stifle this, is, is the paraphrase. Um, and after that, they had a conversation with the developers of Open4, which we have still not heard the content of. We just know they talked. Mm. Um, and then the day after, or the day of that they had this conversation, a new update came out for Open4, and it was just like a little bug fix, but it kind of, like, a lot of people are taking it as, like, a sign that, like, that conversation went okay, and maybe mm. they'll be able to reopen their doors or continue developing it. Ho hopefully that happens. I think yeah. that's kind of what we're waiting to see at this point, because um, we, we were talking about this a bit this morning, and uh, our writer, Chris Livingston, who's kind of been really following the situation, said... You know, uh, at this point, the Open 4 developers have not come out and said anything. They haven't put out any build or anything. So we're kind of just waiting to see what's going to happen there. Um, but I think the outcry over the modding situation was significant enough that, you know, Rockstar and Take-Two were kind of like, oh, you know, we need to, we can't just put this decision we made out there and just let it lie. Like, we need to really think about this yeah. and at least try to address uh, some of the community concerns. Because the game got like something like ten thousand negative Steam reviews uh, in a day. Wow! Over this, yeah. um, which unbelievably for a game is actually not a, like a huge. It's kind of a drop in the bucket for GTA. Yeah, for most sure. for most games on Steam, yeah. that would be you know extraordinary, right? Yeah. And it's still a crazy spike even for GTA. But based on the number of players that game has, it's you know it didn't totally sink their average uh, mm. review score all the way down. But this is something I've been looking at um, a, a bit recently. The kind of the trend of um, when there is a controversy, gamers going to the Steam page to leave a negative sure, review because yeah. it in a way that's the most effective voice i think you have as a yeah, as right. a player as a consumer yeah um and it yeah, you know sometimes it's a good way to make your voice heard sometimes it's um can be more of a a mob effect uh, mm -hmm. as we know happens on the internet from time to time um but it, i'm kind of glad to see that it's had some impact on on mm -hmm. this situation at least it sounds like the um, allowing single player and then just, you know, not allowing the modding for online might be a good compromise for now. Yeah, I think that's what they want to do. And maybe they would have even done that from the very beginning um, if it was that simple. But I think the way the game mm. is built, mm. um, kind of the way you would mod the single player and the way you would mod online probably has some overlap. Mm -hmm. Like I'm I'm no, nowhere near technically proficient enough to, to know the details of that. Mm -hmm. But my guess is they didn't build the game in such a way that they could say, you know, oh yeah, right. modding single player uses this framework and like meanwhile the multiplayer is untouchable. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope that they can figure out a way to make that a little more feasible and let some of these mods exist without hacking just being like a rampant disease on the the online player base so what's one of the most popular like mods right now like for gta that's a good question we have a list of of really good mods um i know there was one for gta 4 that was uh really popular and fun that just completely wrecked all the physics in the game so that yeah. when you would uh we actually nice. had like a video of this years ago where you would try to just go walk down the street and all the cars would just be flying around like there was like a tornado going through the city awesome and so you would just be trying to dodge cars you know as they came flying towards you um but in gta 5 i'm not actually sure what the like the most popular mods are i know i know that the the liberty city one was was pretty popular mm. um Pulling up our list. Does it bring here. the whole city into, into yeah, GTA 5? Yeah, it, it, it essentially makes mm. GTA 5 GTA 4, um, which is kind of crazy. Uh, and there were, I know there are just like, like things like like being Iron Man and being Hulk are like popular, popular in, yeah. mods. Uh, um, just silly little uh, like character changes like that. Like Wes, you were also, also mentioning Geralt. Uh, people love that stuff, and I love that stuff because it just makes for like really weird, really weird moments yeah. in those games. Seeing Geralt walking around with like an SMG is just a, a very strange experience, but but fun. And there's a lot of graphic mods too, just to mm -hmm. like change up the lighting and texture work and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You know, with mm -hmm. people like shooting for a more realistic uh, look, which is like a big thing for screenshotters who like to mm -hmm. go and like, can I make GTA look like a real city? You know, right. like reality. So. 
it's, By a, way, it's still a developing situation. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see I what mean, happens. And that's the thing is like since Rockstar had that conversation with the Open Four developers, and then the Open Four update came out, like it's basically just been radio silence. Like the Open Four's web page still says. It is still this splash screen of we're stopping development due to a cease and desist. Like they ha they haven't mm -hmm. they haven't updated since then, so we don't we just don't know yet. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Also, the mystery of pumpkin has been solved. Uh, pumpkin eight one one nine. It's because eighty one was taken, so they added nineteen to the end of it. Nineteen eighty one just flipped. Okay. Don't worry about it, Wes. Uh, we also got some more subs. I'm, Chris86. I'm for somehow now more confused. Than <laughs> I'm a little confused too. <laughs> Chris86 for 15 months. Lost Pariah just resubscribed. Koss just subscribed. Rob Hankin subscribed. Man, a lot of subscriptions. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. We love you all dearly. Uh, another thing that I quickly actually Battle Tank brought up in the chat that I did want to mention and I kind of forgot about was. Um, Paradox. Did you hear about the Paradox price switching? Yeah, so I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, as well, mm -hmm. but kind of this controversy and the GTA thing both kind of came to a head at the same time. Uh, Paradox had adjusted the pricing of some of their games in different regions, or maybe all of their games. I'm not sure on the exact details, um, but they made them more expensive in some parts of the world. Uh -huh. And uh, you may have some experience with the process of setting prices on Steam uh, through the back end. I know like a little mm -hmm. bit about it, but I've never had to do it myself, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's a tricky thing to decide how much a game should cost in different parts of the world, right? Yeah, because, it really you is. know, $30 in the US, if you do a straight conversion to Russian currency, for example, you're probably not going to want to sell the game at that price for a lot of reasons due to the basic income of the people in that country, mm -hmm, due to the totally. prevalence of piracy, you know, in yeah. different countries, right? So Paradox increased the prices of some of their games in some regions, and a lot of the fans were really unhappy with that mm. and had a... There was like a, a lot of threads on Reddit and lots of discussion about it, lots of discussion on Paradox's own like communities, and they eventually decided to to lower the prices back to where they had been. Really so, interesting. Yeah. And I don't think this was like a you know they didn't massively increase them right, but it mm. was some tweaks across the world and and people were upset about it. So, mm. but yeah, if you have any insight into kind of what it's like trying to decide what a game should cost mm -hmm. in different parts of the world i'd be interested gosh in i mean yeah well i mean just deciding what a game should cost by itself is, is, yeah. is difficult <laughs> you know what i mean because you're like okay i don't want to price out some people like i don't, I don't want it to price it too high that most people that people are going to hesitate to mm -hmm. buy it you know yeah. but then again i don't want to price it so low that it seems like it's um too cheap you know or or it's or it's less quality or less less gameplay you're going to get for this price um, and then, and then that that applies to all countries too, right? Our opinion of what's expensive is not what is expensive in other countries. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I'm, I'm sure that's incredibly hard to do that. But I don't know. I guess my feeling on the matter is that just if you just do a straight price conversion, you're probably going to have the least problems. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly, yeah. but that's my feeling. It's so hard to to. Like pricing has also just become the wild west on Steam in the, in mm. recent years because it used to be very like it was much more structured. Yeah, it was much more structured, right? Mm. You had your sixty dollar games that you know I guess used to be the fifty dollar games, and then you had kind of like it was there weren't as many games that were coming out that were like less than that, unless they were like handheld games or or something like that. And now it's just like how do you judge a one dollar puzzle game? that you could play for five hours compared to like a roguelike that you could potentially play for 300 or for play it through once and never touch it. Like there's all mm -hmm. those different things. Like this was something I was gonna bring up actually in the in the Steam sale part of it. Um, like Terraria is $5 mm -hmm. right now on Steam mm -hmm. with the Steam sale, which is like, they've been updating that game for five years. Yeah. And they just like keep updating it, yeah. and it's it, it's an insane amount of game for five dollars. But they're they've never thought about raising the price from ten dollars, which is the base price. Like they just mm -hmm. it just is the price of that game. It's just it's so there's so many levels to it. Mm -hmm. 
And, I mean, free-to-play games and uh, mobile games have both had a really mm -hmm. big impact here, mm -hmm. right? Like, I'm sure oh, yeah. so many people's yeah. opinion of what a game should cost is now colored by, like, well, I can play Dota 2 forever without spending money, mm -hmm. uh, or I can play this, you know, I can buy this mobile game um, that is probably free to play or cost me a dollar or something. And and then, you know, maybe there are microtransactions, but that still just changes the way you think about value. And I know Nintendo for quite a few years was kind of fighting against this like mobile game pricing trend of saying like, no, we think our games should cost more money. We think they have, you know, X yeah. amount of, of value, um, which I agree with, but then it's really tough uh, on the mobile side. I think Steam, mm -hmm. thankfully, people are still willing to pay more money, but like and mobile putting a game out for $5, you're gonna get a fraction of the audience that you would get you know, at free with in-app yeah. purchases or whatever, right? So it's it's tough. I don't envy anybody who has to, oh uh, to make these decisions. Yeah, are we scaring you? I feel no, like we're no psyching you out. No, right now. not at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting flashbacks to my last video game, which which had to deal with all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. we, my friend and I made this MOBA game. It was like a crazy zany iOS only MOBA game, and it was free to play. And we completely bombed financially. So we spent like two years of our lives making this game we thought was great and um it made absolutely no money so we were not able to continue with that project or with that so and that was all because we didn't really understand the whole free-to-play thing and i really think it has changed people's um uh, uh, opinions of how much a game should be or how how to value games and it's in some ways it's like it is kind of the wild west in the sense that we're kind of blazing this new territory where we have this free-to-play model um but in some senses like i really hope that um, people kind of can separate that in their minds and, and say, okay, some games are, you know, meant to be bought and meant to be pl paid for upfront, and you're going to get all this experience, or hopefully you'll get the experience that you're looking for, you know. Um, and then some games are free, and they're kind of just that model. And I hope that people can kind of just make that distinction, you know, so that we can um, say there's a value system for these kind of games, and there's a value system for those kind of games. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw a commenter, honestly, uh, like, I can't remember, I think it was in a review I wrote where he was, he, some commenter said, I purchase games or I judge games, like his personal scoring system is um, hours divided by dollar amount. Hmm. And that's his score mm -hmm. is it, if he can get more hours than the dollars would suggest like that's a better game and mm. if he plays a game for 10 hours and it was a 60 dollar triple a game then he doesn't like it as much which mm. i think is just like I i'm sure he's not the only person that thinks about that that way but it's yeah. it's just so it's amazing how much it's shifted the more the more def uh, expendable income you have kind of the less important that becomes right i suppose like, yeah like, you know i would totally willing to pay uh I think it was fifteen dollars at Journey, uh, the PlayStation game cost when mm -hmm. it came out, or twenty dollars, and like that was a game that I played once and didn't really ever feel the need to play again. Um, but that, and it was two hours long, you know, or mm -hmm. something. But that experience was something I've never had in a game before, and probably mm -hmm, will right. never have something quite like that again. Yeah. And you know, even at that, at fifteen dollars, you say like, oh, that's a lot of money for two hours for a video game, but like. Man, I have to pay twenty bucks to go see a movie in San Francisco, and that lasts uh -huh. that lasts well, two hours. You know, we can't even. I mean, I'm <laughs> sorry to cut you off, but like, I can't even begin to get into the, like the cost comparison thing because I'll look at a game on Steam and be like, five dollars. I don't know if I want this for five dollars, and then I'll go and I'll spend like like ten dollars on a food truck meal that I like could have just made pasta at home. You know, like it, uh -huh. it's. Like food is such a different thing to me because I'll just spend like weird amounts of money on food, but I'll I'll hesitate at games that are less than it's, that. It's all about your priorities. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I want to touch one more thing real quick on news, and then we can move on. Um, which is, Elite is actually getting their Thargoids. Like it's actually happening. Elite Dangerous actually has aliens coming. Um, I mean, we've known they had aliens coming for a long time, but it's always been like these weird cryptic uh encounters that have happened in the game yeah I've, I've played very little elite so basically all i have to say about this is cool yeah that's kind of what i wanted to say that's honestly why i wanted to bring I, it up i think frontier has been planning this for a like long a really long time like they've been slowly unrolling this campaign to 
bring this kind of alien war conflict into the game, yeah, uh, which is super cool. And I have no insight into anything that you know will actually happen as a result of this. Yeah. So we 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 finally have like it feels like before like Frontier, the developer Frontier was like kind of feigning ignorance, like really badly, right? Mm. But they were like, oh, what did you find? You know, <laughs> every time someone saw aliens. Uh. Um, and now it feels like they're actually like, all right, this is happening. Here's a trailer for it. This is going down. And yeah, cool. it, it's it's neat. It's just neat. I don't, so it sounds I, like a real slow, long tease. Oh, yeah, for like Very a year, awesome. I think. Yeah. That's I don't cool. even I remember like the first time they, they showed off the aliens. Um, they showed, I guess the first thing was the barnacles that's they found these like space barnacles on a planet sweet and everyone was just like what the heck yeah, are these i think initially it wasn't even the developers weren't going out and talking about it right it was like players found some small you know sign uh, they kind of added to the game and yeah. then they're like what is this and then yeah. kind of, you know could this mean this and then the developers you know gave a little bit of tease and then slowly over time it was like added it, more stuff it was like the most me, you know, like glass clear transparent like ARG ever done right like it, it was like everyone knew what they were doing the entire time but like people were still so into it and I was still so into it I don't know it was it was neat um, awesome yeah let's talk about um, actually I want to talk about Wes do you want to talk about delitting real quick because I really want to have you to share this story sure Wes you did something crazy um, this is not news. I'm yeah. not newsworthy. Uh, no, well, we can we can make this well, part of the um, the the now playing basically because yeah. I want to touch on it. Yeah. So my my now playing uh, experience last week, um, what I was kind of spending my uh, my work time on. I guess it was last Tuesday I did this. Um, kind of spent the the afternoon um, at home with my home PC, uh, taking it apart and taking my CPU out and uh, doing something known as delitting, which has for a long time been like kind of the most extreme hardcore modding you could do to your to your PC basically. Uh, what it involves is if you if you know what a CPU looks like, it has this kind of silver piece on top, right? And you might think that like, oh, that's the part that's doing all the computation, but the silver part is actually just a hunk of metal that's uh, the, a heat spreader. So it makes contact with the CPU die, which is you know the actual brain of the CPU. And uh, you have some thermal compound between the die and the heat spreader. And then the heat spreader is basically the piece of metal to take that heat and transmit it up to your radiator. Kind of like a heat sink then. Exactly, it's it's just like the heat sink. It makes contact with you know the whatever kind of cooler you're gonna put on top of the CPU. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for a long time, the really brave uh, members of the PC kind of modding community have been cutting the heat spreader off of their CPU with the purpose of replacing that thermal compound with a better a compound that is more conductive to basically better conduct the heat from the die to the heat spreader and then up to the radiator and lower your temperatures right? wow so by lowering your temperatures you can overclock your cpu more you can just run it at a cooler temperature which will potentially give it a longer lifespan mm -hmm. kind of you know there's there are concerns about if you run your cpu at higher temperatures higher voltage it might die in three or four years instead of 10 years or something mm -hmm. there's not like a lot of data out there that proves that but that's one of the reasons people do it um, so some of Intel's CPUs in its history have been soldered. So instead of just a thermal paste between the heat spreader and the CPU die, there's actually a solder material there, which you do not want to cut in half. Um, and, and that <laughs> stuff is, is better uh, also at conducting uh, the heat. But their last several generations have not been soldered. So there's a really good opportunity there to get lower temperatures on your CPU die. Uh, if you're brave enough to do this, and thankfully a uh, a like professional overclocker, a guy who actually competes at these uh, at these competitions where they'll have you know a stage with five or ten guys and a CPU on there, and they're like pouring liquid nitrogen onto the Whoa. onto the CPU to cool it down, and like running all these benchmarks and stuff to get high scores. Uh, this guy uh, he, he goes by the the handle Derbauer. 
uh, built this little tool, which if you're watching the stream, you can see on screen this kind of little metal box that you can just put your CPU in, and he kind of designed the cutout for it to properly fit the CPU, and then you just put this little slide tool above it and use a, a hex wrench to screw it and like pull it tight, and it will basically push the heat spreader off without any risk of damaging any of the components uh, underneath. Whoa. So he just figured out like the proper elevation, the right amount of pressure it was gonna take. Uh, and so it makes the actual delitting process really, really easy and essentially risk-free unless you put the CPU in upside down or, mm. or you know, sideways or something. Uh, you'd really have to try to, to mess this part up. And so then once you take the heat spreader off, you can wipe off the, the thermal compound. And I bought this uh, like liquid metal uh, cooling material that's, uh, that's really good and kind of put a piece of tape over the PCB so I didn't spill anything, right? And then spray this liquid metal on it, kind of uh, wiped it, spread it across the die and then put it back in my computer. And what do you know, it worked. I didn't break anything. What? Uh, somewhat to my surprise, I thought maybe I would I would ruin some, some part of this process, but it all went off really well. And it brought the temperature of my CPU down quite a bit even after I overclocked it. So, Whoa. you know, my, it's not like my CPU was overheating before, it was fine, um, but I now am running it at a really cool temperature at a higher speed, uh, and I'm pretty satisfied that I was able to do this without breaking anything. How did you feel when you first started it, though, right before you're about to take that lid off? Like, what was the feeling? I was, I was like reasonably confident. I would say it was like 50% confident, 50% uh, nervous about a couple specific points in the process. Mm -hmm. um, one was just the feeling of the, the delitting where you're pushing the heat spreader off with this right. tool. Uh, oh, it man. feels like you're crushing it because mm. it takes a lot of force to turn that hex mm. key because this thing is like glued with like high, yeah. you know, really high intensity glue, right? So it felt like I was squeezing it in a vise. Uh, but wow. once that popped off, it was kind of like, oh, like it really popped, um, but it was fine. And then the other part that I was mostly nervous about was scraping all the material, all of that glue, like off mm -hmm. the PCB, because you want a good, you want, when you put the heat spreader back on, you want it to kind of sit yeah. flush, right? And I didn't want all that gunk in the way. Uh, and I wasn't really sure how how much pressure I should put on the PCB, right? So uh, we have like a photo of, I was like scraping it with like a Costco, you know, credit card, like membership card, right? So I was like, I wasn't sure if I was gonna scratch it, you know, do any damage. Um, and, and it ended up fine, but I did it very slowly and gingerly where yeah. I'm sure someone who has done this a few times probably just, you know, rips the thing apart and, you know, scrapes yeah. it off in five minutes and is done. Um, but I was, I was taking my time. Dude, I... Like, wow. I, I put the CPU in the motherboard, like, first when I'm building a machine, and I'm just like, I never want to touch that again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, the CPU is the <laughs> thing that I am most nervous about when I'm building computers. I really hate putting the cooler on. That's the, the, the part that mm -hmm. drives me crazy. Although, with liquid coolers, it's very easy now. If you're using, a like, an all-in-one, you kind of just clunk it on there and you're good. Yeah. Um, but I'm still used to the, like, the Cooler Master uh, Hyper 212 Evo is kind of the, like, perennial cheap cooler recommendation we make to people. It's, like, 25 bucks. Great cooler. Um, but it is a bitch to install because uh, <laughs> you got to get this, like, tension rod right. And, and, and anyway, it's a, it's a pain in the ass. So I always dread that part. So that made, like, f futzing with the CPU not as bad because I was like, well, at least I don't have to to deal with this pain in the ass CPU cooler. So, so why don't they make it? Why, don't, why aren't they making CPUs with that awesome heat dissipating that's a really good question right uh, <laughs> i think <laughs> i just do that i think it, somebody yeah, somebody I, at intel is like huh <laughs> i'd never thought of that before <laughs> i think it all just comes down to to money um, yeah because at the scale that they operate you can uh it would cost millions more dollars basically to mm -hmm. use this more expensive material mm -hmm. um because I, I can't remember offhand how much i paid for the tube of this stuff uh, but i think it was like ten dollars or something and uh -huh. and i didn't use all of it but you know at, at the scale that intel manufactures cpus even five cents adds up you know, when you're making millions and millions and millions. So I don't know how much the thermal compound they cost used. I don't know kind of how 
much easier it is to apply than the stuff I applied because um, the the liquid metal is a conductive material, whereas regular the regular thermal interface uh, material oh, will not conduct electricity. Non conductive. So That's, you do not okay. want to put you don't mm. want to spill any of this liquid metal stuff. Uh -huh. Basically, that can be a, a big problem. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's kind of more dangerous um, than using the other stuff. And as long as you're careful, right, it's no big deal. Actually, but. yeah, pu pulling up this this uh, shot again, like you can see, this is the, the, sorry to the podcast listeners, I'll describe, but like the thermal compound that they had on there before, like spilled over the edges, right? Mm -hmm. Which is probably because, like it probably they, they don't have to be concerned about it, right? Because it's non-conductive. They can mm -hmm. just like throw it on there on a factory line and like it'll... If it spreads, it spreads. Like, that's okay. Whereas, Wes, when you were putting on this stuff, like, you had to put down tape to make sure that when you put it on, you could take off the tape and it would, like, it would only mm. be on that little CPU. Yeah, so exactly. it's probably even that the if the material is not so much more expensive, the like, the, the manufacturing process to, like, be more careful about it would probably uh, also cost yeah. them money. Yeah, it, oh, yeah. It, that may well be the case. Like, I'm, I'm not an expert on, right, right. on most of the stuff uh, around this process. And I think we had a, one commenter who was, like, very amateurish delitting do job, uh, but one, it worked, so shut up. <laughs> uh, and two, of course, it's an amateurish delitting job because I've never done it before. So, you know, what do you expect? Why is it going to sneak around to everyone's computers in the office and like it, pop? I will. <laughs> I'm like, I'm offering my services now because I still have the delitting yeah. tool. Uh, thanks to Derbauer for for making that, and he actually gave me one after I interviewed him at Computex a month ago. Uh, so yeah, if anybody in the office. Uh, wants a delitted CPU, I will eagerly tear it apart for them. <laughs> um, let's talk about, actually, let's jump right into uh, talking about some Steam Cell stuff, because this is also a little bit of, of what I've been playing lately um, in, in games I wanted to recommend. Uh, let me just pull this up, excuse me. So what I want to do is is basically, if you guys have any recommendations of like games that you saw on sale or or think are worth grabbing and that sort of stuff, some big discounts. I, I just want to hi highlight a few things um, that I think are worth getting that maybe people have missed or overlooked. And then also, if you guys in the chat have any suggestions in terms of things that you have bought or anything like that, um, please tag us with that PC Gamer and let us know. The first one I want to bring up, though, uh, I think Wes will also want to talk about, as I'm typing it, he can see, uh, is Hollow Knight. Have you have you played Hollow Knight? I haven't, but that's I think that's on my list. Yeah. Yeah, Hollow Knight is. Um, how do I put this? Everyone go play Hollow Knight. <laughs> <laughs> like that's your description. That's of my the description game. of it. it. It's a fully hand drawn or om almost entirely hand drawn uh, Metroidvania game mm -hmm. that is like just incredible like I, I've talked about Hollow Knight a lot on the show before but I talked about it mainly when it was coming out and it was talking about how it had this hitching problem when it first came out where even if you had a great computer and it was really uh, inconsistent in terms of how people had it mm -hmm. but like for me about once a minute the game would just like hitch for a second and then continue and it was like it it basically ruined my experience of the game it made me just kind of want to stop playing um and I never really went back to it. I got about six hours in, and then I stopped. I'm now 27 hours into this game, and I have five it's, more hours to go. Whoa. It is huge. It's, it's, way, it's way bigger than I thought it was oh, at, yeah, at first glance. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, and it's, I think it's only like 30, 33%, like a third off on Steam right now. So it's like usually $15, and it's 10 for the sale. Oh. But... It's just a beautiful game, and now that I'm not, like, now that that, that, um, that hitching problem is gone, like, there's nothing stopping me from just realizing, like, how good it is <laughs> um, and how much I want to keep playing it. So I, I'd recommend that to Tell anybody. Tell me a little bit more about this one. Um, yeah, please. With the Metroid style, the Metroid part of it, do you actually gain abilities that allow you to access more of the world, or? Yeah, you do, and it's mostly movement abilities, mm -hmm. uh, at least so far. I've, I've played less of it than Tom, um, but it's, you know, in Metroid, a lot of the, so the gatekeeping is done through, like, you need this type of gun to open a door, right? Mm -hmm. You need the ice beam, or you need mm -hmm. missiles, or, you know, uh, super bombs, or something. In Hollow Knight, it's a lot more of it is getting the ability to wall jump, getting the ability 
ability mm. to dash, getting the ability to do like a ground pound, uh, that kind of stuff. Sweet. Um, but there might also be some weapon-based um, bits as well that I haven't gotten to yet. That's going on. I'm going to buy that today. I'm gonna get that today. <laughs> it's, it's a really fun that was game. It's really rad. I've, yeah. I've been enjoying I played it basically all weekend. Um, yeah. I, I played that and Killing Floor 2, which we'll probably talk about some as well. And uh, so Chris86 actually says Hollow Knight was eventually too tedious for my tastes. I haven't mm. found it tedious, but I will say that what Wes touched on is maybe one of the faults of the game, is that there there are combat abilities, but they're not like, like I haven't used a lot of the combat abilities. You use uh, more of the movement abilities. Ah, uh, um, okay. And so like that's maybe one of the big drawbacks for the game for me is like, eventually it gets like the combat is kind of the same the whole way through it's got the same pacing you fight a lot of enemies the same way mm -hmm. um but i've just had so much fun like exploring that mm. i haven't really had trouble with that like i haven't uh that hasn't dragged me down so far i actually prefer the combat in hollow knight to either a metroid or a castlevania game uh because it is the fights are sh are not kind of uh, numbers or stat based the way they would be in Castlevania. Like this isn't a game where you're leveling up and getting, mm -hmm. you know, oh I got 13 more hit points and that kind of thing. And you're not equipping new armor that gives you, you know, seven more defense and stuff like that. It's not a numbers game at all. It's it's much it's much more finely tuned than that. You know, mm -hmm. it's like enemies are going to take you know. 20 hits or something like that and you'll have some abilities that go into play there but it's much more about getting your like single strikes in or your you know two or three strikes and being able to dodge effectively and deal with the timing of that uh and it has really good feeling like contact delay when you hit stuff so it's really punchy right the whole screen freezes for you know a tenth of a second and then you get that like Sweet. that great feeling of impact when you hit stuff yeah uh and and it is not a game where you can just get uh to a high enough level and like tank damage like mm. there were definitely yeah. fights in metroid games where it's like okay i have six energy tanks like yeah. i can kind of just stand here and soak up the hits and yeah and just shoot a bunch of missiles into this thing's face and I'll mm -hmm. probably be okay. Hollow Knight is not a game that lets you do that. No, yeah. I tried that strategy actually just on a boss recently that I can't beat and a, for the record, completely optional boss because I feel Sweet. like I feel like about half the bosses in this game you could just ignore entirely. Like there, there are bosses that are on hit behind hidden walls in offshoot sections that are optional on their own that if you kill them you get like a new like like equipable thing it, it, it there's so much just like random stuff you could not experience like wes you were saying wes was telling me like i i tried to i'm farther than him so i tried to ask like, where, whereabouts are you and he was like oh i just got this one thing um and started to talk about like the path getting there and i realized like halfway through him talking that we had gone on 100 percent completely different paths yeah. to get to the same spot and cool. the path that he had done i had just done 25 hours into the game and he had done like 10 10 hours in yeah which is just huh. like it's crazy that there's that much choice there's that much freedom in i it. may have gone the hard way <laughs> i may have <laughs> i may not have taken the the best path but i got there so yeah it's it's just I I'm sorry I'll stop gushing about so, Hollow Knight because I could literally just do a whole show on Hollow Knight. <laughs> Hollow, Knight, Hollow Knight's great. Yeah, you should you should play it if you like uh, if you like that style of game, kind of Metroid-y, uh, Castlevania -y games. Definitely play it. Well, you guys, um, um, I have a list of stuff. That yeah, I can, if you guys pull up some some of what you were thinking of, a couple of things that people are like calling out. Uh, XCOM Two is sixty seven percent off. Uh, Soma seventy percent. Uh, some people were saying they got Pit People on sale. Mm. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, the Telltale series was picked up by Turdog, Ori in the Blind Forest, which is another great platformer. Yeah, I was going to compare those. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, oh, Favis says the new Serious Sam top-down game, uh, mm. which is apparently, like, that kind of came out to not so much, so much fanfare. Is that a, a dual-stick shooter? Twin-stick shooter? It is. Mm. Um, the Serious Sam's Bogus Detour, <laughs> that was the name of it. Uh, here, I'll, I'll pull it up. This is... Um... Devolver or Tiny Build? Sorry. Uh, Devolver. Devolver, right. Yeah, yeah, it's a Devolver game, or Devolver published. Yeah. Um, and it's it's like a, up to 12 players online, I think. Uh, I love their trailers, man. Yeah. They, they do awesome. They do good stuff. 
<laughs> they do real good work. This actually looks really fun. Yeah, I would I would check this out. <laughs> it came out like uh, last week, week or two ago. Um, so it's pretty new. Uh, sort of in this vein, I have one to recommend that's on sale on Steam right now. Please, uh, Assault Android Cactus. Oh, I remember hearing about that. Um, awesome strange name. name for a game, uh, and an art style that may put some people off. It's very like, kind of uh, super deformed, uh, like. A anime kind of chibi look, uh, but it is a really fun, like instantly crazy chaotic uh, top down twin stick shooter um, with characters that all play really differently, uh, just like different types of weapons and stuff. But it, I mean, it is just like a pure arcade game, um, and it, it is really fun, uh, just manic action. So hmm. I think it's like seven bucks right now or something like that. On Steam, so uh, yeah, I think it was seven seven fifty. So it's half price, half price. Half price. Uh, yeah, fun game. Definitely recommend that one. Um, let me pull up a list of you a few, prepared, man. few others. Yeah, um, so a couple you might be able to talk about uh, yourself, Tom. Death Road to Canada. Yeah, is on sale. Oh. Have you you familiar I've with seen this it, one? Yeah, uh, really cool. Like. It, is Oregon Trail like a somewhat appropriate comparison? Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's Oregon Trail where the sections of Oregon Trail where you have to go like hunting or whatever are like like a top-down zombie action game where you're like looting houses. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be played co-op too. We've talked about that a bit on the show. Uh, Worms WMD, Weapons yeah. of Mass Destruction, is the latest Worms game. And there's like 10 Worms games on Steam, right? <laughs> um, but we really liked the, the latest one a lot. It, it was very good. I mean, it's, it's still Worms, um, but it feels like... Uh, it's one where they went back to the 2D art, so it looks really nice. It doesn't quite have like some of the weirdness that the 3D ones uh, had, just in terms of how they controlled and um, you perked up at worms. Of them. Are you... It's 2D gameplay then, or is it 3D gameplay? It's 2D, 2D gameplay, yes. and 2D art. Uh, oh, so for nice. a while they right were on. doing like the 2.5D yeah. thing and like playing with water, mm -hmm. like physics and stuff. And this one they just went back to the everything. I've always preferred know, that 2D worms. Gameplay style. Yeah. Reminds for me sure. of the, when I was like 14 years old playing it on my old, old PC. And this one has like a lot of the um, kind of like the customization options, like secondary modes for, you know, like forts. And mm -hmm. they added vehicles to it, which are kind of kind of fun. You can like get in a tank and uh, Sweet. shoot it, shoot at other players. Um, so, yeah, it's it's very much worms still, um, but I think with a good number of options for tweaking it to be, you know, worms as you like it. So if you're going to buy a worms game on Steam for local multiplayer or, or online, that's the one that they actually have a, go to. They have a mode because there's all these presets for, like, rule sets. The rule sets can get really customized, and they have a mode, a preset in WMD that is just called Armageddon that will set it to be the item sets and the starting health and the oh. all that to be as close to Armageddon as you can get it. Which was probably, um, like, the quintessential Worms game up to this point. Yeah. I would say. Probably. Uh, let me th just throw out a couple other games there. Uh, the Witcher 3 is half off if you haven't played that yet. What are you doing? What are you doing? Mm. <laughs> uh, you're, you're not playing The Witcher 3, which means you fucked up. Uh, Wolfenstein The New Order is also, I think, half off. Mm. Um, or it's, like, 20 bucks or something like that. Great shooter campaign. Highly recommended. Uh, Goner is a fun, um, oh, yeah. uh, 2D, like, side-scrolling, uh, yeah, roguelike, uh, recommend that one, it's a lot of fun, has, like, a very 90s twisted Nickelodeon feel to it, like, kind of, uh, Rocco's Modern Life in the, yeah. like, like I, I think, I think that was what it reminded me of when I first played it, um, more like the audio it just has this like uh -huh. very off-kilter sort of sensory experience to it so yeah. it's not that it actually looks like a nick cartoon from the 90s but it just kind of has that vibe yeah um, i love this game made by ditto you get these different heads and stuff like that and different guns it's almost impossible to get past level one though it's, it's really like, hard it's very yeah. hard <laughs> roguelike you know there are bosses and stuff but it's it's got this cute animation style Everything everything forms around you, so everything's all dark at the edges of the screen. As soon as you get near stuff, all these bones appear and stuff. It's really interesting. It's yeah, I love that effect of the 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 platforms like just being created in front of him as he yeah. walks. It's one of those the the hard games that I've played where you you can like go into a 
situation, feeling t totally in control. You've just like right. ki killed a few enemies. You've been doing fine, and then you just go into the next room, and it just instantly <laughs> just completely goes to shit. And you're yeah. just like, oh god, oh god, oh, I'm dead. Yeah. Uh, it, it gets real intense uh, very quickly, but it's it's fun, and it's like three dollars on Steam right now, or something crazy. Uh, so definitely play that one. Yeah, it's three dollars, seventy percent off. Uh, the Blendo Games collection, um, which I think is all of the Blendo games, um, highly recommended. Like Thirty Flights of Loving, Quadrilateral Cowboy. Well, um, you're gonna you're gonna have to go into this one a little more because I don't, I don't. Blendo is oh, Blendo's Adam Zombie Smasher. That's the one I know from them. Yeah, so it's they're just really creative. Games, they're all, hmm. they're all really. Uh, I guess you can't be really unique. They're all unique, um, interesting games that do stuff that you'll probably never see in a in another game. Uh, especially Thirty Thirty Flights of Loving, and I think Quadrilateral Cowboy, which is the sort of the the hacking, um, the hacking game. Uh, Quadrilateral Cowboy. Right. It's like very sort of cyberpunk. Uh, you're carrying around this like chunky. CRT computer deck and like hacking right. into to systems, um, just just cool stuff. Uh, yeah, they, those are those are all worth experiencing. And uh, last but not least, Deadly Premonition, which is on sale for like two dollars and fifty cents or something uh, absurdly cheap. And with all of the Twin Peaks uh, fever going around right now with the new season of Twin mm -hmm. Peaks, I think it's a good time to. Experience Deadly Premonition, which is very much a Twin Peaks knockoff or homage, depending on how you look at it. Uh, it's kind of the ultimate B game of just very, very weird, quirky personality, uh, thanks to Suda51. Or it's not Suda, it's a Sweary, sorry. Sweary, it's a Sweary game, just bizarre as all hell. Um, lots of direct Twin Peak. References, uh, but really fun, really fun. Just like weird characters in this game. <laughs> that's a good like. It's a good call out, man. It's Japanese Twin Peaks, so if that, <laughs> if that sounds appealing, you know, pay two fifty for it. Yeah, it's ninety percent off. It's usually twenty five dollars, and it's two fifty right now. There's there's a scene at the beginning with the main character talking about coffee, uh, as you would expect from a Twin Peaks homage. That's like worth <laughs> it's worth two dollars and fifty cents just to experience that cutscene because it's so weird. Was there anything? I know I kind of sprung this on you before we started, but was there anything you wanted to like call out games wise for for? Gosh, man, I've been living in a bubble. Yeah, I've been, like seriously <laughs> fixing bugs. Like, until my eyes bleed. So I haven't really been looking at the Steam do, sale. Do you have any favorites from 2016 that, like, most likely, if it's on Steam, it's on sale right now? Like, there's a good chance uh, that it's, well, you know... Well, okay, favorites of 2016, I'm going to definitely say Hyperlight Drifters up there. Oh, is yeah. Is it on sale? I, I, I bet it is. One it of is. my favorites. I love action RPGs Yeah, it's 50% so off. There so you it's go. usually $20. Hyperlight's 50% off. Hyperlight's a great game, dude. Yeah. Some of the best artwork I've ever seen in any any like 2D game. Mm -hmm. It's like crazy cool, so cool. And a lot of their animations are like really high frame rate too. So you can tell like the artists spent so much time creating such quality art, and the whole experience is amazing. If you've ever if you've ever played an action RPG, you're probably gonna love Hyperlight. The, the attention to detail in it is is marvelous. Yeah. yeah. And I, I played it um, somewhat recently after they patched the game to run at 60 mm, frames per second because right. oh, it was right. initially 30 yeah. and uh, actually played through the whole thing with a friend because it has a co-op option mm -hmm. oh. and uh, it, it doesn't figure into the narrative at all. It's just like you you just have a second drifter show mm -hmm. up. Um, mm -hmm. But it was a really fun way to play the game. And we were playing it on a PC. Uh, and then he also owned it on the PS4. So mm -hmm. we booted it up and like compared the two. And after we had played about five hours of it running at 60 FPS on PC, mm -hmm. and then we went and played it uh, at 30, we were like, oh, wow, we can really uh, tell a difference. Because yeah. it's a game that it's so fast-paced and satisfying. Mm -hmm. Just like the, the feeling of movement and combat in that game is really precise, mm -hmm. like you yeah. say. And like yeah. really the hits just feel great and... It's it's kind of vicious. Yeah. yeah. It's like it's like what if 
Zelda was super vicious yeah. in its combat, right? Uh -huh. And just, you know, no holds barred. Like, these enemies come at you fast, and you move fast, and you die fast. Yeah. Uh, and once we felt that difference between 30 and 60, we were like, wow, we're really glad mm -hmm. that they spent those extra six months or something that it took to, to kind of retune the game that way because it, yeah. it paid off. Such a snob. Such an FPS. You know, when, <laughs> it's one of the few games I've ever actually compared directly playing yeah, it two it's different Yeah, it's one of those rates. games where you really want to. It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. So you want it to be like 60 FPS. And, you know, least. I could have played it at 30 and I still would have enjoyed it. But once I saw the side-by-side -side comparison and appreciated mm -hmm. the work it took them to to tune it yeah. for this, the latter, I was like, okay, that really, really paid off. Yeah. Um, um, can I call out one more? Yeah, yeah. well, I, w I was just oh. real quickly going to say... Hyper Light Drifter was one of the first games, one of the only games in like the last like year or two where I just sat down on a Saturday morning and like basically didn't stop playing it until I had beaten it Sunday. Whoa. Like yeah, that, nice. that game got we, into me. We did the yeah. same thing. We played the whole game in a sitting. Yeah. Um, or in maybe wow. maybe in two days, but we we played through the whole thing. But please continue. Oh yeah. So if it's on sale, it'd be cool. Um, my favorite game in 2015 actually was Axiom Verge. Mm. Real fan Spe of that game. Speaking of the the Metroid yeah. lineage, it's also fifty percent off. There you go. You're calling out like winners yes. here. Yes. Also ten dollars was twenty. Yeah, this is like this is straight up Metroidvania. Like, yeah. If you haven't played Axiom Verge, you're in for a treat. And this <laughs> is if you like Mex Metroid e games. This is an impressive. Uh, accomplishment too because this was a game is it thomas hap is that the yes. developer's name yeah he worked on it solo completely uh -huh. solo yeah. for f five years yes. or or longer maybe I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly how much time but you know to to put something together and like to do the music to do the yeah. sound to do the programming you know like that is uh -huh. a, a hell of an accomplishment i think you're preaching to the choir here <laughs> are, you, are you doing everything for for your game yeah yeah wow. I'm a solo developer too all right well yeah I got a lot of respect for this guy, for sure. He even had to do the first be bit of making Axiom Verge part-time. So, like, he was mm. he had a wow. job, he started working on Axiom Verge, and later he finally was able to do it full-time. So you, I'm sure you have, like, even f f way more appreciation than me for what it takes to work on each one of those individual components yeah. and, and put it together yeah. into, a, into a game. And that can really create a, co a cohesion mm -hmm. that you mm. can't really experience any other way. Yeah, that's what um, Eric Baroni, when I talked to him, the creator of Stardew Valley, mm -hmm. who, who did a similar thing, he did mm -hmm. all of all of that uh, himself, he said a similar thing that, like, even when he signed on with Chucklefish as his publisher, he was like, anything, like, they can work on the port and they can work on localization, but anything that is, like, creative, mm -hmm. he wanted to come from his mind so that it just kind of all made sense to him. Yeah. Um, so that, that's an important important aspect for you too or oh absolutely yeah that's a and lot of damn work when do you sleep <laughs> <laughs> um at night <laughs> he's well, been asleep in the morning. most of the show actually it's just like it, he, he takes a uh, podcast time to like re recuperate yep this is his recharging now um <laughs> then uh yeah that those are both really good calls man because those are like those are games that have maybe fallen off the front page of a lot of people's mm -hmm. steam recommendations and whatnot and and are still worth going back for especially yeah. if they're 50% off right now yeah like how, I, so here's a question that actually just came up out of out of my brain um but how do you how do you feel about like people waiting like when they see a game that's like maybe 15 20 dollars and then they were like oh, okay i'll wait for that till it's 10 to buy it like does that does that rub you the wrong way as a developer? Do you understand it? You know, all that sort of stuff. Oh, not at all. I do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, for me, it's like, uh, if I'm really excited, I'm going to buy it right away. Like, right. I, I played Hyper Light Drifter the first week it came out. Um, and then, um, but, but some games, I'll be like, you know what? This one is not really what my alley, or maybe, maybe I'm not I'm a little hesitant to play it. So I'll just wait for it to come out yeah. when it's on sale. And I think a lot of people, maybe, well, I'm assuming that other people do the same thing. So I don't know, maybe the chat can tell us whether that's like something other people do or what, mm -hmm. like, so I'm not offended by it at all. And I think it's a cool thing that at least if a person can, is kind of somewhat interested in the game, they can follow it. They can wish list it and later when it goes on sale, get it mm -hmm. in. Cool. I, I think one thing Steam has uh, has gotten better at, and something they could probably always continue to improve, but they've done a lot of work to try to make 
uh, stuff more games more visible long after they've come out, mm-hmm. and part of that comes through wish listing stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And so then when there is a sale, it'll actually show you, you know, hey, these games on your wish list are on yeah. sale, and also the recommendation engine. So if you bought, for mm-hmm. example, Axiom Verge, when the Steam sale comes around, it quite likely would recommend a game like Hyperlight Drifter or Hollow Knight to you and go, mm-hmm. hey, we saw that you bought this game. Here's this other game that a lot of people who liked that, you know, also yeah. like, right? So yeah. I think that probably helps uh, keep kind of games at top of mind for people when they may have just forgotten about it because they missed that, you know, initial launch mm-hmm. excitement, right? Mm-hmm. All right. I want to uh, not have any more further ado, man. I want to I wanna dig into your game. Play some Songbringer. Because we're talking about these pixel art solo developer made <laughs> metroidvania ish games and uh, and i feel like we have to be talking about yours next um would you describe yours as a metroidvania or no 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 well okay when in, at least when i think of a metroidvania i think of like a, a side scrolling platformer uh-huh i don't know that maybe that's maybe that's no me, I, I think that's the most it's that's fair. what will come to most people's minds yeah. for sure yeah so it's more of a it's more of a zelda like game it's more of an old school action rpg classically inspired um, but procedural, so you know you, it's, you can be different. It can be a different world each time you play it. All right, let's load it up. Uh, mm-hmm. We're gonna do a demo of Songbringer, uh, and Nathaniel, I, I think we were saying you should uh, take the reins for the first round, and then okay. we'll we'll have one of you guys jump, uh, either Wes or I, jump into to play it after that. Cool. Um, just gotta untangle the controller, because oh my goodness. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so here you are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Excellent. And uh, to the, of course, the the preface uh, as as it is needed is this is unfinished, right? When, right. Yeah. Ha- this is beta. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can jump on in and show us what you'd like to show us. Um, cool. The it's wh- when are you planning for for com- release ish? Um, this is going to be late summer. Late so summer. we're gonna have a we're gonna have a release date pretty soon. Um, we don't know exactly what a release date is because we're just lining it up with Microsoft and Sony and all that. So this is coming out on Steam, uh, PS4, and Xbox One. Um, but you're part of this this intergalactic crew aboard a spaceship named Songbreed, which you see flying by right wait, there. Wait, are we a spaceship full of wizards? <laughs> no. Okay. I'm just a wizard because it's my internet handle. Gotcha. Okay. I yeah. just I just wanted to see if this was both sci-fi and and fantasy happening at the at the same time. It kind of has that sci-fi fantasy feel. Okay. But yeah, there's not really any wizards. Um. So, yeah, this is kind of my dream game. I've always wanted to create <laughs> play a game that's like a Zelda-like game, but be have it be able to surprise me each time if I wanted. Mm. So the whole concept is you're able to um, enter a world seat at the beginning. And um, it will generate the entire world, all 10 dungeons, all the overworld, everything based on this world scene. Um, there's a feature where it can just play in there, huh? It's giving you can you randomize random, it? Yeah, random world seeds or whatever. I like that the world seeds are like names do rather they, than just like need, a string of characters. Do they need yeah. to be actual words or can you just no, type in you random can, you can gibberish? you type in whatever you want, you know, and it'll give you a whole world based on that. So hmm. that, that's just basically your world seed. Um, but what I'll do is I'll jump into one of the more advanced uh, plays because you, what you're seeing here is a game that takes like, you know, probably the average person is going to take like six to eight hours, I imagine, to finish one world mm. the first time. Unless you're really thorough, you're probably going to play longer and find all the secrets and stuff because there's secrets everywhere. Um, but I'll jump into a, an advanced save where I have a lot of items already. Um, so you can kind of see what there is to offer in Songbringer, like in the later game. So I noticed uh, real quick as you were going to start a new game that there was the option for normal and permadeath. Yes. Can you kind of explain how that factors into the length, of, uh, like a campaign might run, and and uh, what what happens if you die in mm-hmm. a normal game? Yeah. So in regular versus permadeath, they're almost exactly the same. So regular mode is just like a regular campaign or action RPG where you're playing it out, it's saving your progress, and as you um, as you die, you're able to continue, um, and you continue as many times as you want. Um, but in permadeath, it basically the only difference is that you um, you cannot continue. Once you're dead, it kills your save file, and you have to start a new one. So um, there's there's well there's two characters you can play as as the second player too. So there is a local co-op uh, mode, and normally you start with this little robot character. In fact, let's let's like actually go to the other save so I can show you the little robot first. 
The robot's name is Jib, and he's super cute. And he basically he sent he scans enemies for you. Whenever you um, defeat an enemy, he'll go and scan them and find loot and stuff like that. So um, there he is. He's scanning. He scanned and found a diamond right there for me. Um, you have lots of different kind of weapons. So you have the sword, which is your main weapon, um, and it gets you get another item called the ghost sword, which shoots out that projectile thing. Um, so your sword becomes like a projectile as well, a lot like the master sword from Zelda. Um, and then you have a, um, a top hat, which you can throw as like your boomerang. So it's like a weapon, <laughs> and it's a uh, it's a tool. You know, you can pick up stuff, and you can see I have it crafted with ice so there's five different elements and all these elements are you can craft to basically create a whole different kind of weapon set so i've created an um an ice top hat here which allows me to freeze enemies and also freeze water and, and walk across it so i just froze that water and walked across it to get up here and so that way you can it's a lot like a metroid game in the sense that it opens up more and more of the world as you as you gain items and stuff and it the influence of of Zelda one is extremely like immediately noticeable, right? Like mm -hmm. the for for those listening on the podcast, it's it's basically that big gridded world, right, where you're moving through these stationary screens, um, and, and you move off the edge one direction and you go to the next screen, uh, which is a, a cool way. I've always liked that method of like breaking up little bits of gameplay, and I imagine it yeah. it helps you a lot in terms of making sure these worlds work randomly every time yeah. because you can kind of treat them like Legos almost. Yeah. Well, and that's that's the thing I should kind of point out too. Like a lot of games that are procedural will draw, a designer will go and actually draw a whole bunch of screens, mm -hmm. hundreds of screens, and then the computer will go and stitch them together at, ran, at, uh, at random at runtime. Um, this is, works a little bit differently. It uses algorithms for everything. It, it has this whole algorithm generator for the overworld. It has algorithms, special algorithm for all the dungeons. And um, so a, a room or an area could be totally different depending on what's around it. So maybe there's a lake or a, a river to the left, and that, that creates a totally different area for you uh, in, a, in a particular world. So one of the things you were talking about a bit ago, like using the, the elemental properties, ice to freeze water, and then you can progress uh, past that water. Um, how much of those items, abilities, uh, are you going to have kind of at the outside of the game? Like, how are you going to accrue them? Are you just going to find them around? You have to, like, level up to, you know, get get that stuff? Like, how does that work? Right. So you start with absolutely nothing. And in a second, okay. we'll... You guys will try that out and you'll see. You basically start with not even the sword. So it's your choice whether to pick up the sword at all. Um, that's one of the things I loved about the very first Zelda, is that you had the choice of whether you wanted to pick up the sword. You could beat the entire game without the sword. Except I think you do need to get the sword to beat Ganon at the end, or something like that. But I didn't know that, actually. I didn't know yeah. you could just walk away from the guy. You can. You wow. Can, I mean, he's in the cave. You don't have to, to get go the sword. Yeah, I guess so. And I love that. I love how that it gave you the choice as a player. Like... Do I want to do this or not? Uh -huh. You know, and that's one of the real core concepts of Songbringer is that um, you're allowed as a player to make the choices that you want to make. Do you want to? Do you want to know where the first dungeon is? If you do, you can use a bio detector, which is this item that flies out it's like a scanner, and it goes and it finds dungeons for you. Mm. Um, but if you if you're one of the players that just wants to explore on your own, you don't want anybody telling you where to go or what to do and how to do it then you don't have to, right? It's your choice as a player. And that's, I've always wanted to build everything into this whole game around that whole concept. Will, if you want to, will every item be available in every run? Yes. So okay. Every, every item is available. There's tons of items. As, as I was just kind of like showing you, there's like, there's bombs, um, there's the top hat you can throw. There's these cactuses you eat, and you get these psychedelic powers. You, you trip out. <laughs> I'll eat one right now, actually. I'll eat a cactus, and um, the screen will kind of do this trippy effect, and I'm invincible for a short while, and I gain back some health. And <laughs> it also can open up secret walls and stuff like that. So some walls will only open if you eat a cactus. And uh, another uh, similar thing to the cactus is the meditate ability. You can meditate, and the meditate reveals secrets as well and um, does other kinds of things. You have the blink orb, which allows you to teleport forward. Um, there's these killer bombs, which are like super bombs. Um, there's the lighter, which you use to light things on fire. Your teleporter allows you to go back to Songbringer, your spaceship. The cup, you can drink things. Is that a solo cup? That's just like, <laughs> a, like a red cup? You find a solo cup. <laughs> 
Yeah, and there's these flasks which refill all your, your health. There's those scanner drones which will, like illuminate the map for you. The bio detectors give you, uh, show you where dungeons are. But then there's just everything else, man. Like you get more diamonds. Um, that's the top. This this run I did an acid top hat, so that the top hat does this like acidic damage over time. Hmm. Um, but man, there's just like I could go on and on about all the items and stuff in the world. But yeah, you're gonna find in every world there's every item somewhere. But wow. you're gonna have to find it. So there's no find it. Yeah. there's no guarantee that you'll have everything in a single run because right. it's up to you how you explore. Yeah. Um, most of them are like items like the, the important items are usually things you would get from beating a boss mm. So you're gonna find a dungeon you're gonna go explore that dungeon You beat the dungeon beat the boss in it and you get an item from that and you usually get health from that, too And the bosses are the same each each run as well, right? So there's it's the same ten bosses There is one optional boss which is totally hidden so there's actually 11 bosses, but they're always the same, right? They're just going to be in different locations and in different orders. So sometimes I'm going to experience, you know, the, the goat-headed demon first, and sometimes it'll be the blob, the blob guy or whatever. So this really, you know, a, a lot of times nowadays people will, like, the, the games will lump procedural and roguelike together, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But, like, this is in no way it seems like a roguelike. This is very right. much a procedural adventure game or yes. action well, game. Well, there yes. is the permadeath option. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So that's right. that's part of it. But even if in the permadeath option, you still have, like, a lot of game to get through yeah. if, if, that you just can't die in. It's... I, I just... W I was asking about, like, the items and the bosses because originally when I heard about this, I assumed it would be more like a Binding of Isaac type of thing, mm -hmm. but it's, like, it's very much not that. Yes, it's a very important distinct distinction to make because... Yeah, you might think, oh, I don't get to save my progress at all. But yeah, you totally get to save your progress by default. There is a lot of stuff building up on the screen. Yeah. Is that yeah. all is that all like slime guts? Yeah, because all these slimes can like recombine. This is a really kind of crazy boss to beat, actually. I'm actually in the very last dungeon. So I'm this is this like kind of a boss crawl type dungeon. Um, I don't know. Should we? Should we have you guys take a look? Or what yeah, we can. Yeah, I'd, jump I'd in. be happy to. Okay. Should we start one from from yeah, scratch? You think? Go right ahead. Yeah. Here are all these pretty tools you could play with. Yeah. Now take them all away. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry about that. But yeah. Save and quit. Now. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious to kind of see it. See it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perma death. Perma. No. Okay. <laughs> what are you gonna name it? Tom. Aw. Now, can you just do three letters, or does it have to be six? You can do three, yeah. <laughs> oh, Tom gets his own world. The Tom, Tom, shucks. Tom world. Shucks, Wes. It's just going to be the worst. It's going to not. It's going to air out <laughs> live. Um, this is beta, so there might actually <laughs> yeah. be a few problems we encounter. Who knows? He, you haven't finished the Tom world yet. How do you even go about testing a game like this if it's like yeah. 8 to 10 hours of gameplay across well, a procedurally algorithmically made world? Thankfully, you know, I play it a lot myself. Like, I'll do my own test. But thankfully, I'm backed by this publisher. So I did a Kickstarter in 2015, and, and that uh, did well and allowed me to continue making the game. But then um, this publisher approached me, and they're like, hey, we can help you get it on PlayStation and Xbox. And so they have the, they have their own QA team, and mm. they're awesome. I mean, they're, they're always finding bugs and stuff like that. So, But when it comes to actually testing this game, there's actually no way to test every single world. Just to create the world takes the computer half of a second. So to create, you know, it's actually 300 million worlds or whatever. I don't really want to get very... Um, you know, what's the word? People are kind of averse to procedural these days because oh. of a certain game that came out a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to mention it. But all, I think we're picking up what you're putting say, down. It would take a computer so long to, to test every world that even a computer couldn't do it. Yeah. So there, so basically, I'm just throwing up my hands and going, you know what? You get, you'll get it to a point where it works yeah. well enough, and then yeah. And if you if people find a certain world which does have a certain bug, I will fix it right away. You know what I mean? You just gotta go in and like check the common six letter words that people are gonna yeah. type out. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> So if you, uh, when you play the game now, do you just see, like, Matrix-style the algorithms at play that are causing, you know, problems or, or not problems, but just the way, you know, pieces are put together? Well, actually, I'll tell you the truth. I sit down when I'm, I'm going to play it, and I smoke a big bowl. 
I get really <laughs> high. And that helps me to forget all that stuff. You know what I mean? And I get into the experience of like, okay, what is this game like? What am I what if I were experiencing this for the first time? That's what I try and put myself into the mindset of so that I'm playing it like a you know, like like I enjoy. It. This is my dream game. Like I was trying yeah. to say, this is what I've always wanted to play for decades. Like I wish I wish this game would have been out for a long time ago. So, uh -huh. so for me, it's really fun. I actually get into it. It's probably it's one of my favorite games to play. And I, but I do have to play it a lot too. So, I really like that you like. I, I, it, it, all, I, I said this a couple times. The Zelda influences are clear, but it really doesn't just. It doesn't look like you just remade Zelda or anything like that, right? Like it stands on its own in a very very big way. Thank you. Um, where like that first shot, that first room, you wake up and there's the cave just to your side yeah. that you can enter, right? Yeah. Like that's like a very clear Zelda thing, but like yep. in an homage, not in, in a in a rip. But you it's know? a nano yeah, sword, so. Tom. It's a nano sword. Well, that was what I was gonna bring up too. Then like the nano sword, the whole aesthetic is you, you're in the wizard outfit because you because you're handle, but like this game is super weird, like sci-fi, but also party-minded, yeah. but also like a little bit of fantasy and swords in there. It's uh -huh. a crazy aesthetic. How did you, like, how did you, I guess, come up, like, how did that come about? This is your dream game. Was that just like oh. what you wanted to do? Oh, yeah, I can tell you all about that. Please. So I love going to Burning Man. Um, it's like, Oh, Wes, Wes, you got... Oh, oh Wes! jeez. I died in the down, first man? room. Almost. You got this, you got this. Is there a, is there a dodge or a block or Not yet, or so all you have is a okay. sword. But yeah, you'll eventually you'll get that. Um, but yeah, so I, I've, I, I love going to Burning Man. I love the whole aesthetic there because um, it's one of the only places I've ever been where I wasn't worried about money. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if anybody else knows this about Burning Man, but it's this place where you basically you're not in, you're, you you don't take money there. You take you take everything you need, and then you go out and you party in the desert for a while with other crazy people. Um, so I kind of wanted to create a game which which was kind of like honoring that aesthetic, where um, where it it just money didn't matter so much but people having fun did mm -hmm. so this so the whole plot behind this is like this is a time in the galaxy this is actually set in the milky way galaxy um and it's thirteen thousand years ago so this is before our, our kind of our human history we know of right now um on a planet um near the star bellatrix so it's in the orion constellation not too far from us actually where we're at here on earth um and i mean relatively right? relatively right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're part of this intergalactic crew aboard a ship named Songbringer. You fly around to these different planets and you survey them, map them, and stuff like that. And then as soon as you're done, as soon as your work's done, everybody parties. So it's just kind of like Burning Man in space. You're looking for different planets to go not only explore, but also party on. <laughs> Can I, uh, just as a strange aside... My granddad goes to Burning Man. Uh -oh. He discovered he's been going to Burning Man for ten years. He discovered it when he was like seventy, and he he Whoa. felt he was yeah. I love him to death. If you're watching, I love you, Papa Marty. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'll try to get him to play this game. It might not be his style, but I'm sure he'll he'll <laughs> appreciate the feel. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's it's just like a very and I mean this in the nicest way very strange looking game yeah. right like it's a yeah. beautiful beautiful pixel art but like it's just a weird aesthetic that is really really cool um i had a question that i cannot remember now so what what is what is wes i guess like wes what do you what do, what how do you feel compelled like I'm, are you I'm just exploring the randomly from, from day of the tentacle right now <laughs> <laughs> You, you're just like picked a direction, right? And you yeah, start going. Yeah, I don't, don't really know what, um, you know, where I'm going specifically. I'm just kind of looking around, trying to figure stuff out. Exploring my world. Exploring Tom. <laughs> <laughs> the bio detector. Oh, this is oh. the thing you were talking about. Was would show kind of where the bosses yeah. were. Yeah. So it kind of does that to you. Like it lets you explore for a minute, and then if you're if you're feeling a little bit lost, maybe you haven't found the first dungeon yet, it gives you a bio detector, and you have the choice of, do I use this? So it's on left. Is it on left it's on click? L. Yeah. Either one of the L buttons should. Oh, I see. There we yeah. go. Oh, I guess it was only one of the L buttons. <laughs> <laughs> I was clicking the stick in instead oh, of uh, uh, instead of doing the. So shoulder now buttons, so. now you have you, there's a little green dot on your map, or one of the squares on the map is yeah. that you have not discovered is green. Yeah, over to the left. Mm -hmm. And now you know that is a boss, basically. Right. Cool. Yeah, so th this is kind of like the core of it. Like I was saying earlier, like I'm, 
I really um, dislike the trend that's gone on over the last like two decades, I would say, where games have gotten more and more like tutorial heavy and like locking you into certain choices and, and like um, and you know holding your hand the whole time. Um, this is really meant to be the kind of thing that does not hold your hand, purposefully does not hold your hand at all. Let's you explore, lets you make mistakes, lets you die, mm -hmm. lets you get lost if you want to get lost, but tries to help you out if you are if you are feeling lost a little bit. Yeah, I, I'm sorry if you already explained this, but what's, what's the consequence for death if you're not doing permadeath? You just are able to continue, but you have to start back at um, the, either the home screen if you're on the overworld or a refill area. Or if you're at the, in a dungeon, you have to start at the beginning of the dungeon. Gotcha. Yeah, but you keep all your items. You keep everything you've collected. So you really are not losing any progress. You just kind of have to fight your way back a little bit. So there's there's consequence, but it's not like... It's not the type of consequence that will um, petrify you in, in from trying things, right? right. Like in Dark Souls, right. I'm, I'm not to compare this game to Dark Souls. Not doing that, everybody. Um <laughs> Because it's too easy. I'm just saying, like, in how it's not like Dark Souls is, like, there are times in that game where I look down a path and I'm like, I could go down that, yeah. but I don't know. And, like, don't. This this seems like the type of game where you would just, I would just want to, like, explore everything. And if I die, then I die and I go back and I try again later or something yeah. like that. It's meant to not be too punishing. Yeah. Yeah. So more, more accessible to a, yeah. You, so you met a person. I didn't realize there'd also just be like people on this planet. Yeah. So there's a few NPCs. Um, there's so you're at the beginning. Your your spaceship comes to this new planet named Exera, and you uh, you're part of the scouts. So the the hero's name is Rock. He's one of the scouts, and um, Jib is also his little friend robot. And you're scouting around the planet on these bikes, these sky bikes. There's four scouts, and you all get hit by lightning. So there's actually three other scouts elsewhere here in the overworld there's a few other little npcs um and then there's this crazy npc which is like your spirit guide mm. and um you'll know him when you see him <laughs> <laughs> so basically he's the one that kind of gets you on the path to learning meditation so how much how much of these different map sections have you Kind of hand designed because you mentioned that they can look completely different based on what's around them and mm -hmm. a lot of that i imagine is like making sure all the edges fit together and and mm -hmm. you don't have like a path that just leads to a blocked wall and stuff like that yeah. um but like how much of each of these map screens did you did you craft mm. okay so that's that's a really important distinction because um I didn't actually craft anything with like a level editor for okay. any of this. All of this is code. Wow. Every single screen is a, is an algorithm that that generates something. So I'd say there's like maybe 100 or 200 different algorithms that like are for all the different kinds of areas and stuff like that there might be. This particular one right here, for example, is a is a certain algorithm where it knows how to craft the edges, and then the middle is something else. So this middle is a special area where there's this like this archway, and you, there's a story element that happens when you're when you and Jib are there. Um, so yeah, that this algorithm is a little bit different because it's got uh, it's got different it's got an algorithm for its edges and an algorithm for its inside. Mm. Um, and then and then the the dungeons were completely different. So once you get into a dungeon, you'll see like there's um, on the overworld there's there's up to two paths on each edge which can go, um, but in dungeons there's only one path which can go to a certain. Hmm. So I don't know. I might, I might be kind of confusing. No, no, no. Like, that's that's definitely what I was asking about. Because I mean, it it's it's cool to hear that there is so much of this. Is is you know we were looking at Hyper Light Drifter earlier, um, and they're like seem like relatively like in the same vein games, but that mm -hmm. that game is all handcrafted in right, terms of yeah. its levels. Mm -hmm. um, but this doesn't feel particularly like like if I think it, it, it's the type of game where it looks like at least from what I've seen so far at, at packs previously and and watching Wes and you play right now I, like i bet you could trick someone right with this game like i mm. bet you could not tell them it was mm. built randomly and just like mm. put them in front of a build of it and they'd just think it was fine you know like they'd think they'd think it was just a 
a game they were playing. All right, I got some bombs now. Nice. Yeah, you bought the bombs. Cool. Bought the bombs. Ooh, you're about uh -oh. to get something else. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, I hope that this game comes across that way where people don't think, oh, this is a procedural game, but yet that it does have that Ooh, that bump, that benefit that, oh, if I want to... If I want it to be different every time, I can. Yeah. Um, and I spent like so much time on the overworld generator and the dungeon generator and every single area's algorithm. So there's been so much human time spent on creating a world mm -hmm. that feels bespoke, but yet is can be flexible and things can change and everything can move and right. stuff. Uh, we can open it up also while we're while we're playing while Wes is showing it off. Um, let's open it up to, to questions. So if you do have any questions uh, for Nathaniel about Songbringer or just for us in general, tag us with at PC Gamer in the Twitch chat. I have chat open on my phone here, so we can keep taking questions while you uh, while Wes is is showing the game off. Uh, there was one question earlier that I did want to bring up right away, which is somebody was asking if like. There was a pre-order page, or like it's already up. There's already a Steam page, so you can mm -hmm. you can wishlist Songbringer if you'd yeah. like. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, there's a, there's a Steam page already where you can wishlist it, wishlist it, and then Songbringer.com actually has a pre-order page. Um, it's still in its beta, like, um, and it will only be in beta for like a month longer, basically. Um, but yeah, if you want to play the current beta version, there's a thirty-two dollar pre-order. Or else you can order the game at $16 and pre-order it and get it when it comes out, which is going to be about the price on Steam. It's going to be about $16. Bucks. Cool. Um, ties into our previous conversation right, about yeah. price. Yeah. Um, here's a question, actually, I might need to distract Wes to ask real quick, yeah. uh, which was a good question earlier when we were talking about Steam sales. Uh, Turdog is asking if he should get Ori in the Blind Forest or Hollow Knight between the two. So I haven't played as much Ori, um, okay. but I would say I enjoy, I, I don't know, Hollow Knight's a bit more traditional in terms of the combat, I mm. think. So I, I would say I would I would prefer Hollow Knight over, um, over Ori. Uh, just from from what I've played of Ori, but that is not a knock against Ori. Right. Uh, they're both people love that game. That game is good, great. Yeah. yeah. Ori is a bit more on like the acrobatic side. Right. In terms of your, right. Uh, the, how it prioritizes movement and stuff like that. So I'm gonna cop out and say both. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, let's see. For Nathaniel, as an indie dev, Varendale asks, as an indie dev, uh, do you just straight up make the game you want to make, uh, how you want to make it? Or do you still put a degree of research to figure out if it's likely to get a good reception and succeed? So like, oh my gosh, this is such a great question. Yeah, this is such a great question. Oh my gosh, um, and like, okay, and I'll, I'll give you my experience because my last my last game was a complete failure, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but uh, it was I honestly think that it was because I was trying to do the research and because I was trying to like make it something that people would want, mm -hmm. right? I think when you walk down those roads and you're trying to make things based on what people you think the trends are or like you think people are going to like something, you end up making decisions that cause you to make your game weaker, actually worse. Mm. It's watered down and it's not quite you. You know what I mean? It's not quite what you want because you're trying to do what other people want. And um, and with Songbringer, I, I learned my lesson. I was like, okay, we, we went down that road. It didn't work. Let's make something straight for my heart. Let's mm -hmm. make something that I want to play and not really care if the the world will want it. And I didn't even know if this game would would do well at all. I, my whole plan was, okay, I'm going to spend four or five, maybe six months and make a prototype, then do a Kickstarter. If the Kickstarter succeeds, I'll continue making Songbringer. Mm -hmm. That's what my whole thought was. I, I don't care. I'm not going to do any research about what people want or you know any of that kind of stuff. I'm just going to make what I want to make the most and make my dream game and it worked you know yeah. like for some reason maybe maybe it's because i put passion into it maybe it's like this is what i wanted or something like that but it really really worked well for me to just follow my heart and and make this how i wanted and the kickstarter succeeded and then a, a publisher backed me and it's just going well now so i i would encourage other people to follow their heart as much as possible in anything you're doing Whatever you're trying to do, like I think that following your heart is a really, really good thing. Even if your head tells you it's wrong, you know what I mean. Even if you, your brain says, "Oh, this doesn't make any sense. How are we gonna actually make this happen?" Ignore your brain. <laughs> <laughs> that's my that's my two cents, and maybe I'm wrong, but it's worked for me. Cool. 
Um, that's a, a passionate answer, man. I like that. I like that enthusiasm there. Yeah. Uh, let's grab a couple more questions then. Uh, is there online co-op is an easy question to answer. Uh, no, no, there's not ever going to be any kind of online play, but there is local co-op. I've heard, I, and maybe you can confirm this, I've heard from multiple developers over the years that like, if you want to add any sort of online play, like basically just act like you're going to double your production time oh, yeah. for the game. At least. Like I said, my last game was a multiplayer, real-time MOBA. And uh, yes, that takes incredibly a lot longer. But another thing a lot of people don't realize is that you have to change the underlying game to make it multiplayer. Mm. You can't have an instantly responsive video game that's multiplayer. Mm -hmm. You have to have you have to plan your game around at least a 200 millisecond delay. Huh. So when you're making all these awesome you know multiplayer games like Dota and all that kind of stuff. They will play effects and do all these crazy thill things to make you think that you're actually playing in real time, but you're actually playing with a 200 millisecond delay almost always. Hmm. And wow. Or, or maybe 100 milliseconds. There's always right. at least some kind of delay. But I wanted to make a game that was purely responsive, instantly responsive. And in fact, it runs the input tick even runs at 60 frames a second. Even if the, the game can't draw at 60 frames a second, it always runs its its uh, its tick, basically. That's what we call it as developers, um, at 60. So it should feel really responsive. And and that, that so when you design a game that's, that, that's online or offline, like... You're gonna have to make that choice. Do I want to design my entire game around that delay, or do I want to like, or do I want to have two different modes? And if you have two different modes where one has delay and one doesn't, now you have a game that feels completely different in one mode. So, I don't know. It's a really tricky decision to make, but yeah, the easiest way to do it is just to not make your game multiplayer. All right. Let's see. There's a, another good question in a similar vein to the multiplayer one was uh, X Macho Man, Macho X Man X. Oh wait, he said last time I can just say Macho Man, Never mind. Uh, it says, uh, it looks like from E3, the new direction with a lot of games coming out are really trying to get into eSports. Uh, it's like the new thing. I think it's great for the gaming community, but my friend is not a big fan of it. He's tired of most games going that direction. Uh, what do you think of it? So the question of just like, the trend of everybody saying they're in eSport right now. I think, uh. I think the, Creator of Nuclear Throne, I think it was Rami, Rami Ismail, uh, one of the two creators of Nuclear Throne, uh, tweeted like just today or this morning about how like esport is basically like the new marketing word for multiplayer. Mm -hmm. Like, like that's just it. Competitive multiplayer is now just being called esport by a lot of big developers, um, which I think is maybe like like a slightly unfair generalization, but also like a good point, right? Like a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of developers- It's definitely buzzy right now. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. A lot of developers are into that word, uh, whether or not they actually think, or whether or not they actually will be a successful esport, I think is not, not up to a lot of developers. I think it's up to the community that forms around the game. Like if you're, mm -hmm. it's really, really hard to force a game to be an esport. Like even with Blizzard and all of their money, like they're having trouble making Heroes of the Storm a successful esport and they're having trouble making Overwatch a successful esport. Mm -hmm. um, which I think speaks wonders to like how hard it is and how much you can't really force it. Yeah. Um, but I'm fine with more competitive games. Like I think that angle of it is like, that's cool. Mm -hmm. I need some health. Oh, are you dying? I'm at oh, half yeah. a heart. Oh, if God. only you had meditation or cactuses, but you don't have either of those yet. Um, if only try, you had... Oh, hack down some of these these pillars. These guys or, over here? Yeah, just... It might take you a second, but... <laughs> you might find some health in there. <laughs> uh, let's take a couple more questions. Uh, Chris86 asks, uh, would, you, would you consider using crowdfunding again? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You had like um, a like a successful Kickstarter, right? It yeah. wasn't like uh -huh. explosive millions of dollars, no, but like it was a good all, Kickstarter. Yeah. But yeah, it was a successful thing. Um, I wrote a whole Gama Sutra article about oh, it. Cool. So if you search for Nathaniel Weiss, it's my name, and, and Gama Sutra, I wrote a whole article about this. So if you're interested to hear more, but um, crowdfunding, I think, is an excellent way to prove whether your game is worth your time. Hmm. Right, so I've spent, I've been a developer for 23 years now. I've made a few games, and um, some of them were not worth my time, right? I, mm -hmm. I, a game will take, and I'm one of those people that has to finish everything, so if I start a game, I have to finish it. Yeah. And so a game can take you two, three, four years of your life, five years of your life. I met the developers from, um, man, what's that game kind of like Diablo? 
Path of uh, Exile? Path of Exile. I met those guys. They've been working on that game for like nine years almost. He's like, yeah, I started this game when I was 24, and now I'm 34. It's like, whoa. <laughs> so, oh, you need an item to get past. You have the item. Um, but yeah, so they're... Um, th basically, from a crowdfunding perspective, you can use crowdfunding to prove whether your game's worth your time or not because you can put out, you can like, you can create like a prototype, only spend three to six months or whatever, put it up on Kickstarter, and see if people are willing to put their dollars behind your idea before you go spend three more years finishing it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that will give you some confirmation that yes, this is something people want. Yeah. And I'm not just wasting my time. Oh, this looks bad. There's a boss? You got this. Oh my goodness. I so don't have this. I believe in you. I believe in you, Wes. You're doing, the, you're doing some good work with that uh, hat, Boomerang. That was yeah. nice. Oh boy. That's like you a... Killed Jim. You have like a... Like there's a bit of like a heavy metal aesthetic all uh, in it too, right? With uh, like the skulled beasts with four eyes. Yeah. Jeez. How much damage does my hat do versus the, the sword? Half. But it is, so it is, but you might hit with the top hat a couple times. Mm, right. Yeah, true. Oh, God. That was bad. I like the, the visual language you built into the bombs there with those little red lines going out. Oh, yeah? Where even that thing fell from the sky, like that wasn't Wes's bomb, right? Mm. No, it was and, not my bomb. I have But no you bombs. still, it, it shares the same visual, so you know oh, exactly God. what it's going to do. Mm. I love, I love those little touches. Oh, oh dude. Dude. Gave into the fear, Wes. All right, that might be a good place to stop. That is a good place to stop. We are actually uh, perfectly out of time right now. Awesome. Uh, that, was, so, that was fun, though. Made it to a boss, got my ass kicked. Um, but I'm sure I would do slightly better on the second <laughs> run. Maybe go pick up some bombs. Yeah. That's really cool, man. Um, thank you so much, Nathaniel, for showing that off and letting us show off here, talking with us and all that. We really loved having you on. Thank you for having me. I appreciate um, it. And once again, just so everyone knows, songbringer.com, mm -hmm. songbringer on Steam right now. Yep. Um, your Release Twitter handle coming soon, coming pretty soon. You're dialing it in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have uh, we'll have our actual release day pretty soon, but we're thinking, you know, end of summer. And your Twitter handle down there is at wizard underscore foo mm -hmm. if you want some more updates on the game. Uh, we're out of time. We're going to be, as I said last week, uh, we're going to be off next week for the show. We are doing an office move. In fact, as soon as we turn off this show, I'm going to be taking this soundproofing paneling off the walls, disassembling everything in here and packing it into a box. Um, so we're going to be off next week while we reset up in our new office space, but we will be back the week after that. So, uh... Thank you, Wes, for joining us as well. No problem. And I, I'm glad I got to play play for a good like 30 minutes there. Yeah, man. Exploration. That was fun. And likely we'll be talking about Songbringer in in a, a couple months or whenever it, it comes out. Um, but uh, thank you again, and we will uh, see all of you guys next week. No, we won't. Oh wait, why did I say that then? I literally just said the we're week, not going to be doing happened. that. We'll see you in two weeks. Oh god, <laughs> I'm screwing up, guys. I'm sorry. The pre the pressure's getting to me. Anyway, thanks guys and we'll see you see you 2 weeks from now. Bye. Bye.